farewell to America or just to this year? This week, Pulitzer Prize winner Chris Hedges explains why President Donald Trump is just the predictable end of a long, sad history of American avarice and greed. Then Reverend Billy celebrates the season with not buying but boisterous singing. Hear what happened when he and his partner Savitri D did bid farewell to America and took their riotous rituals to Europe. It's all coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. In his most recent book, America, The Farewell Tour, author Chris Hedges serves up a sobering admonition. Quote, there is no shortage of artists, intellectuals, and writers, from Martin Buber to George Orwell to James Baldwin, who warned us that this dystopian era was fast approaching. But in our Disney-fied world of intoxicating and endless images, cult of the self and willful illiteracy, we did not listen. We will pay for our negligence. Chris joins me in studio today. He is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and author of 11 books. He's a weekly columnist for Truth Dig and hosts the Emmy Award winning RT series on Contact. He's also a pretty regular guest on this program. Chris, welcome back. Thank you. So, um, farewell tour. Um, you have a visa, a passport? You going someplace? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's not a question that is complete uh, uh, speculation. The walls are clearly closing in on those of us who are critics of corporate capitalism and imperialism. We see it with the imposition of algorithms on Google and Facebook and Twitter uh, that have marginalized the site that I write for, Truthdig, uh, and sites that pick up my material with the abolition of net neutrality. And I think that's because the ruling ideology of neoliberalism no longer has any credibility. And therefore, the critics uh, who have already been pushed to the fringes, largely of the internet, have become more dangerous and more heavily targeted. Uh, I think we also... As so you're saying you really, you really are, in a sense, perforce bidding farewell because your voice is less able to be heard, to be seen? Well, there's no room. In, remember, I worked for the New York Times That's for right. 15 years. There's no room in the mainstream anymore for this kind of critique, which should be a staple on public broadcasting, mm, for mm, instance, which it's you. not. Um, and I think we also have to factor in that we're headed for another severe economic dislocation, and it's clear the trajectory of the Trump administration, which is to consolidate, radicalize, and incite that 40%. Um, he, he has steamrolled over democratic norms and rules. Um, and having covered disintegrating societies, it, it number one, happens very quickly, uh, and number two, is often beyond the imagination of most of the populace until it's already in place. Let's talk about that very briefly, because I think some of the stories, some of the situations that you've covered are critical to where we are right now. When you talk about the disintegrating societies that disintegrated faster than even their critics anticipated, what do you think of and what did it look like? Well, I covered the revolutions in Eastern Europe. I covered the street demonstrations that brought down Slobodan Milosevic. I covered both of the Palestinian uh, uprisings or intifadas. I've watched how fast things unravel. And the, the edifice uh, remains in place. You don't see the, the rotting foundations uh, until everything kind of swiftly disintegrates. Um, but it's pretty clear that Trump is, is, is what's vomited up in a, in a decayed and dysfunctional, or what I would call it a failed democracy. That's typical. That's, of course, what happened in Yugoslavia with Radovan Karadzic and Slobodan Milosevic and Franjo Tuzman. You had an ineffectual liberal elite that was not able to address the severe economic crisis that gripped Yugoslavia. Mm -hmm. And then you had an economic catastrophe which resulted in hyperinflation. We do have to look at history to learn from it. There are consequences for dispossessing large segments of your society and concentrating wealth and power in the hands of an oligarchic elite. And, and we're certainly in that moment. We live in a period of relative stability, but it isn't going to last. Tell us the story of the Taj Mahal workers, that, just for one example that you have in the book. Well, uh, the chapter on gambling was written out of Trump's Taj uh, in its waning days. So most of the rooms were mothballed. One of his casinos. Yeah, he'd closed his arena. 
Uh, most of his restaurants were closed. I mean, literally, there were rodents running across the floor. You go in the bathrooms, most of the fixtures don't work. They have plastic bags over them saying out of order. What happened to those workers? Well, in the boom times, when Atlantic City and Las Vegas essentially had a monopoly on gambling, now we have legalized gambling. I think it's in 44 states, almost the whole country. Not including and, Wall Street. Right, not including Wall Street. And uh, it's seen as a form of economic development, which is insane. And which, by the way, was the way the Yugoslavs tried to uh, dig themselves out of their economic crisis. And it doesn't work because as it spreads, of course, it preys on the despair of the, the economically dispossessed. And so uh, charting the decline of those, I interview a lot of workers, as you know, who were in the Taj. Uh, and then, of course, the Taj closes and they're all thrown out. Taj is bought out by a hedge fund by Icon, actually. By Carl Icon, who gets brought into the administration, kind of. Right. You title the chapters of your book, um, which all follows that trajectory. You, you go to a place, you, you report, report on a, ph of a phenomenon, but very up close and personal watching it. Um, but the titles are very kind of seven deadly sin-like. Yes. Um, gambling, heroin, greed, you know. Are these our sins? Are these well, inherent to us humans? In which case, why don't we just say bye-bye to, right. to America? So and, I, and let, I, I don't I know, ants or octopus or something. I, I wouldn't over. use the word sin. Uh, I would use what sociologists call diseases of despair, mm -hmm. that when a society falls into deep decay and dysfunction, it expresses itself in self-destructive pathologies. And so I wanted to knit those self-destructive pathologies together, not just gambling, but the opioid crisis, suicide, hate groups. I mean, Durkheim in his books on suicide, which was kind of an important book for me that I reread before I wrote this, where he looks at what is it that drives individuals and societies to carry out self-destructive acts. And he, he, he cites as the core, it's the rupture of social bonds, the inability to actualize yourself, to find a place, dignity. That creates uh, these pathologies of self-annihilation. And so that, and that's really the core of the book, that if we don't re-knit those social bonds, uh, we can get rid of Trump. Uh, it doesn't in any way ameliorate the dysfunction and the uh, political and economic crisis that we are in. I wanted to show the various forms within American society by which people carry out acts of self-destruction, but always bringing it back to that root that corporate capitalism, neoliberalism, has torn the society apart, created a failed democracy, um, turned probably at least half of this country, which lives either in poverty or near poverty, into, in, at least in the eyes of the elites, human refuse. Um, you know, and this began with Clinton. Uh, so uh, it, it, was, it was really, in essence, saying, our problem is not Trump. Our problem is not Russian bots. Our problem is not Comey. Our problem is not Podesta and all the excuses the Democratic Party uses to essentially mask the fact that they have been deeply complicit in uh, carrying out the uh, economic and political destruction on behalf of corporate power. So is there another way of looking at your America Farewell Tour in the sense that at the end of your book, when you get to the chapter on freedom, which is kind of a mixed bag, partly about incarceration, partly about fighting it, um, you go to Standing Rock, you go to Ferguson, right. um, you look at the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, among others. Is, there a, is it possible that an old order is dying and is something new coming, maybe? Well, we'll go to Gramsci, you know, that interregnum, he calls it, um, in which many morbid symptoms appear. And these are the morbid symptoms. Um, we have yet to coalesce around another vision, yeah. which, as Alexander Berkman and others have written, is vital if you're going to push a society out of the particular morass that it has gotten itself into. Um, and I think inter interregnum is the right word because neoliberalism has been exposed as a, a con, an ideology that was created by the ruling elites to essentially restore class power uh, and dominate as it has uh, both uh, systems of political power and economic wealth. Um, but we, we, yet, we don't have that vision yet. Um, in some countries, like Britain under Corbyn, uh, it's more advanced. Um, uh, you know, despite all of the attacks on Bernie Sanders, he is really a mainstream politician. He never confronted uh, the, the, the deadly assault of empire 
and the military industrial complex, which swallows half of all discretionary spending and has been one of the prime engines in the destruction of yeah. our democratic system. So um, what I fear, I mean, when I go back to Yugoslavia, is that if we, when that economic meltdown comes, and it's coming, the, the severity of it, I'm not an economist, I can't predict, but even the New York Times is talking about the inevitable adjustment, they call it. Um, when that comes, um, those of us who are on the left, who are populists, who are socialists, uh, have been so weakened, uh, far more than in Europe, um, that our backlash, there will be a backlash, may very well be a kind of proto-fascist right-wing yeah. backlash captured by the Christian right, because Trump has no ideology. Uh, but that ideological vacuum is being rapidly filled by mm. the Christian right. The Christian right are an underappreciated, I think, element of the coalition that has opted for you know, has backed Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil, yeah. the second biggest country That's right. uh, on this continent. Um, he really is a fact. I mean, he talks about it, uh, about com groups he'd like to eliminate, women he'd like to rape or not, um, the military he'd like to free up, the weapons he'd like to put in more domestic hands. What are you making of that situation, and, and how does that change the equation to have two such large countries, 210 million people, Brazil? Um, in the hands of these Right, well, it's leaders. not just Brazil. We have Orban in Hungary. Uh, we have these bizarre Trump-like figures, uh, Nigel Farage or Boris Johnson in Britain. Uh, we have what's an alternative for Germany, uh, which has made heavy political gains in Germany. We have Le Pen in France. This is the natural denouement of neoliberalism. And what happens when the credibility of the ideology is destroyed then the capitalist class essentially goes into the arms of the alt-right or the proto-fascists because those are the last allies that it has to protect their interests. And then you get the ramping up of the attacks on immigrants, the Islamophobia, the homophobia, the, uh, you know, the, the, the return of male patriarchy, um, you know, the, the bigotry, the racism. And Trump is, I mean, you're right in terms of places like Brazil or the Philippines, he hasn't reached that level yet. But if we fall into a period of instability or crisis, I don't put it past him. Mm. He, it, rhetorically, he is already inciting people to violence. You have studied with people who came up under fascist Germany. There were always voices calling the alarm as, as we right. started. Um, what can we do to strengthen those voices? Um, how do we listen more carefully, maybe, to hear them? Um, I guess, basically, in a minute, what do we do? Well, I cite Standing Rock, as you pointed out. Uh, acts of sustained mass civil disobedience. That's all we have left. The Democratic Party is not going to save us, especially as they continue to take Wall Street money and refuse to confront the social inequality that is the root of our problem. And this was the power of the Sanders insurgency and the Trump presidency, is that they acknowledge that reality. Mm -hmm. um, but this, the, the institutions are so decayed uh, and so broken, it's really doing what I saw in Eastern Europe, which is 500,000 people in Alexander Plots. That's, I believe that's all we have left. Chris Hedges, The Farewell Tour. You can find more information about Chris's lawsuits uh, in an interview that he did with The Intercept a, a few weeks back. Uh, we'll put a link at our website. That's lauraflanders.org. Thanks for watching. Hey, I'm Laura. Just quickly, we here at Grit TV are proud to bring you independently produced content every day. So 10 years on, we are still beaming a light on the people and solutions that we believe can help move us all forward. And we are trying to raise $40,000 for this viewer supported program. Will you join and give and do your part? 
You're watching The Laura Flanders Show, the place where, as we say, the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. So don't take a back seat. Join us. And as always, stay kind, stay curious, and thanks. Blessed are the consumers. May your Amazon delivery drones full of the latest video games fly into the sun. Give you a chance to clear your head. Blessed are you who confuse consumerism with freedom. You'll be delighted to discover the difference. Blessed are the people bowing their heads over the little glowing screens. When you look up, we'll be waiting for you, your best friends, your best strangers. We're here waiting for you. Blessed are the workers inside corporations. You're always in a hurry. You're never on time. You're always late. But you're already rich. Blessed are the immigrants. We are crossing the rivers and deserts and the tossing the sea. We're escaping to be with you. Keepers, we fly to touch a thousand flowers. Pollination is polyamory nation. We're polynational. Honey be Luya. Blessed are the police. There's an underground railroad from the murdered loved ones to the surviving loved ones. Cops, protesters, prisoners, citizens. We are all on that train. Blessed are the executives of Monsanto. You gotta stop. Stop trying to copyright life. Stop. Do nothing. Just sit there. A kind of wise laughter will circle the earth like a superstorm. Blessed are the children. For you, you will inherit the kingdom of bullets and drowning and starvation. May justice comfort you like the dream of a happy family. May the earth reopen its gardens to you. As you can see in our reporting on shifting power, we are pulling out all the stops today. The Reverend Billy Talon and his partner, Savitri D, lead the Church of Stop Shopping Choir, a radical performance community committed to confronting the god of consumerism itself <laughs> and fighting for earth justice and civil rights through play, preaching, and satirical song. They've been on before, but we haven't been redeemed just yet. In the interest of full disclosure, though, I should say that a few years back, I myself and Chris Hedges uh, were sanctified by the Stop Shopping Church. So thank you both for coming back. You've lived up to your sanctuary. Oh, God, God for heavens. You know? Phew, I'm <laughs> relieved. The, the halo is it's glowing. <laughs> How are you all doing? You all started, for people who have, need a little recap, on a crusade against the big mouse. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Disney does seem still to be standing. And Starbucks is not a fair trade company yet. And Walmart has been forced to go up in their pay a little bit, but most of our devils are intact, I'm afraid. <laughs> but you've Quiet. now gone international. Well. Yes, we have gone international. It's always been an international struggle, though. Those corporations are international. Right. We happen to live in New York, which makes it easy to address the international problems. But you are doing international work. I see you're in Zurich. Yeah. You're in Greece. That's right. Athens. What do you do there? Well, we've developed this global social movement called Tourists Against Trump, which unites one of the largest bodies of people we can imagine, the, the tourist block. 
in one of the most depoliticized. Right here, we're parading through the main touristic shopping district of Athens. And it's an amazing place because there are tourists from all over the world and there are migrants from all over the world. And the whole point of Tourists Against Trump is to sort of illustrate this dynamic that's going on globally, which is that all of us will eventually be migrants or tourists. And, and that is how we will be identified by the state and by uh, corporations. Mm. Now there's also a scene involving a pink inflatable. They, they have they have a contraption that blows the air into this cathedral that goes up and the and the flying buttresses and the crosses like yes go up like that and yes. suddenly there's a there's a balloon cathedral. It's before. quite vivid when it inflates, as you can imagine. It's huge, and yeah. we performed inside. <laughs> that that Swiss art money is amazing. What it yields. The banks that arrest <laughs> us are on a constant <laughs> basis. The UBS. We, we we went right by that UBS with our tourists against Trump. And a great contrast with Athens, really, to be in Zurich, which is also a tourist destination, but the, so rich. But the migrants there are are uh, on the edges. You don't see them. Yeah. They are there, of course, mm. but it's quite sequestered. Are your tactics changing over all these years? Are your sermons changing, Billy? Is it ever difficult to kind of work yourself up into your <laughs> traditional fervor? Well, I've been to so many method acting classes, you know, I just light a match and go. But the, uh, I, I would say the big shift for us has been that human justice must at the same moment be earth justice in 2018. You can't have one issue that doesn't account for the fact that the sky and the water and the soil around you is radically going through a shift. So all justice must be for life. Just not something we're necessarily very good at. Mm -hmm. In particular, environmentalists are not very good at it. They forget about the impact of climate change is mainly against people of color yeah. and, and people who cannot defend themselves economically, cannot move fast enough, can, can't get out of the way. Um, so I would say that's the biggest shift yeah. in recent years. Yeah, I think in the last couple of years, obviously like many activists, you realize you're not gonna affect policy, right? So for us, We've always been in the street. We've always been uh, sort of inventing new forms of resistance. And I think right now it's just difficult because you just don't even know where to start, right? So the challenge is to start at all. What we've done is try to focus on some very direct work we can do. So um, mainly immigration here in New York City, as this is a city of immigrants. Um, and then also inventing these broad kind of uh, creative memes like Tourists Against Trump, which can be applied you know, mm. anywhere in the world and sort of illustrate the global problem that we're facing. So that was just a glimpse of, of the kind of work that you all do. Um, mm -hmm. It's performance, but it's a whole lot more than that. You, you've been on the show several times, Reverend Billy and Savitri, but for those who don't know the Church of Stop Shopping and your, I, want, I don't want to say shtick, but your persona, Reverend, um, where does it come from? What's it fueled by? And, and what are you focusing on right now? We became less and less satirical, <laughs> and, and we found our audiences becoming less and less satirical with us. Yeah. At first, it was pretty much a shtick at the expense of Jimmy Swaggart, because... And the religious know, right. And the religious yeah. right, which is still so much in power, that 100%. satire can't leave our show completely. No. You know? But we say, earth alleluia, and people come over, and, and suddenly, they've just been, they're doing too much suffering, too much premature death around the world. Uh, the, the hope that our own children and grandchildren can live in a place that, yeah. where it's survivable. Uh, immediately, we're in a new world with our, with our church services. We have fired the patriarch, who sometimes mopes around the edges of our show, but I stay in my, uh, my hot pink gospel outfit, and I'm, I'm still a spoof at the expense of those guys. And then we have a choir from all over the world. New Sanctuary, the New Sanctuary movement uh -huh. has been one of the foci of your work recently, and you sent them off um, to the border. 
uh, this fall around the Thanksgiving period. Talk about that connection and the work that you're doing there. They went to meet the migrant. That's caravan. right. We started working with Ravi Ragbir the, 10 years ago. We met him when he'd just come out of detention and uh, we've, he joined our choir and sang with us. We've known him for years. But in the last year, we've uh, worked very directly um, organizing events and actions around New York City to sort of illuminate what they're doing. And their work with Pro Se Clinics and the accompaniment program. And they're trying to take both of those programs down to the border at Tijuana and uh, help the thousands of people whose lives are <laughs> hanging by a thread. Uh, and who are arriving today, tomorrow, the next day, the next day, the next day, and on and on. Uh, so yeah, Ravi and a group of faith leaders went down on Monday morning, and um, we sent them off on Sunday. And it was great to see them always. Well, it's always fantastic to talk with you. If people want to engage with the choir, if people want to join, participate, do they, are there very strict rules on signing up? Do you, are there some kind of Masonic ritual we all have to go through? No. We're all no, in recovery not. from fundamentalism, so we don't really have, we, we don't really have entrance rules, do we? No, we, we go in the street together. I mean, that's how we start, right? So we take that first step together and put our bodies in between something and something else, usually uh, exalted embarrassment. We sing together, uh, but no, it's, it's a pretty uh, porous situation. Come visit us at our rehearsals. All right, we will. Thank you so much. Reverend Billy, Savitri D, and the Church of Stop Shopping. You can find previous appearances of the, of the Church of Stop Shopping at lauraflanders.org.